Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I would like to welcome you to the um, uh, welcome you all to the Nora Symposium. Uh, Nora standing for the National Occupational Research Agenda. We've been holding the symposia for over 25 years, and each year we address current topics of occupational safety and health that are important to our country. I believe this might be our first ever webinar that we've hosted, so it's our inaugural webinar. The webinar is co-hosted by the Midwest Center for Occupational Health and Safety and the Upper Midwest Center for Agricultural Safety and Health. So let me tell you a little bit about our Midwest Center for Occupational Health and Safety. Our mission is to prepare um, an occupational health and safety workforce to address current and emerging issues and threats to our nation's workforce. And we achieve this through academic research and training, as well as outreach. Um, we recently um, developed a sub theme that's focused specifically on disparities and health equity. And considering the changing demographics um, that are occurring in our increasingly diverse workforce, achieving occupational health equity is a public health priority. Now, this is an especially trying time for our millions of workers throughout our country. Um, we need to talk about the fact that we are living through a pandemic. And during this time, we have essential workers such as healthcare workers, grocery, food service workers, food production workers, law enforcement, public service workers, to name a few. We also have non-essential a non-essential workforce, many of us working from home, having to manage the balance between our personal as well as work life. And then there are other workers, temporary workers, many who are suffering from reduced hours and some losing their jobs. So our center really has a special role in addressing worker safety and health, and we're committed to training um, and tackling the issues around COVID throughout the world. We have pivoted our efforts to address COVID strategically. Our center has developed a resource page highlighting webinars, videos, other resources to address worker safety and health during our crisis. Some of our faculty are also actively engaged in real-time COVID research and outreach to our community. Our topic today is, an aging, is our aging workforce. It is a topic that has great relevance to COVID. Aging workers are among the highest risk for death and severe COVID disease. So you will hear about these issues today, about preparing our workforce for aging workers that have great relevance to COVID. I would now like to introduce Dr. Jeff Bender, a veterinarian and faculty in environmental health sciences. He's the director of the Upper Midwest Center for Agricultural Safety and Health. Again, another co-sponsor, a co-sponsor of our web webinar today. Jeff? Thanks, Marizin. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, and uh, as uh, Marison pointed out, um, I'm the director for the um, Upper Midwest Agricultural uh, Safety and Health Center. And it really is a collaborative center involving um, the co uh, cooperation of the Minnesota Department of Health uh, Migrant Clinicians Network, um, the Marshfield uh, Medical Research Foundation, and the School of Public Health and the College of Veterinary Medicine. So we represent a One Health perspective or approach to um, looking at some of these health issues that we're dealing with. And we focus on illnesses and injuries uh, in farm families, in uh, farm workers, and also the producers here in the upper Midwest. And as Marizin mentioned, like many of you, we've had to adjust uh, to the impact and demands of COVID-19, um, especially um, our work in our rural communities. Um, and this includes uh, dealing with a number of questions um, and thinking about how do we better maintain the health of, of our, our workers in agriculture. And as many of you have seen the headlines, um, this has been uh, quite a, an issue here in Minnesota and throughout the upper Midwest. Um, however, we're still pressing forward and uh, we have a number of initiatives 
that are important uh, uh, to our rural communities. And I think uh, the seminar today actually highlights that. Um, we are working with a number of communities and actually one of the things that uh, we'll continue to do even after this seminar is actually try to hold virtual community forums on aging and the aging workforce, especially in agricultural settings. Uh, so hopefully we'll be doing this over the next um, uh, few months uh, in our uh, surrounding partner states of North Dakota, um, South Dakota, and also um, Wisconsin. Um, and if you want to learn more, please uh, visit our website uh, regarding some of these uh, upcoming virtual forums. Now, um, uh, I think that we have an exceptional program uh, for you today um, addressing this issue of productive work and aging. And so I look forward to our session, our discussions. Um, and at this time, if, uh, if our illustrious dean is available, I'd like to introduce and then welcome uh, Dr. D uh, John Finnegan who will provide some opening remarks and start our session. And so I'm not sure if he's here or not yet. I know he had a busy schedule, so hopefully uh, John will be able to, to, to do that. Um, and I just got a quick note in my ear saying that John is not available. <laughs> and so I'm gonna transition this to uh, uh, Dr. Pat McGovern. So Pat, I'm gonna turn it over to you for your opening remarks. Right, thank you so much, Jeff. And hello everyone, we're delighted to have this crowd here. Um, I'm Pat McGovern, a professor in environmental health sciences, and I'm also deputy director of the Midwest Center and run two training programs, occupational and environmental health nursing and occupational health services research and policy. I'm also your moderator today, and in a moment I will introduce Dr. Grosh, but first I have a few housekeeping items. Don't we always? <laughs> so anyways, in terms of those of you who, when you registered, indicated an interest in continuing education credits, please know that in the week after this conference or this um, webinar, you'll receive an email from our continuing education staff, which it has a program evaluation that we need you to return in order to send you your continuing education certificate. So just something to remember. And um, I will also mention, oh, I'll change now to our agenda. Our agenda is for Dr. Grosh to speak for an hour, followed by 15 minutes for your questions and his answers, and some closing comments from Dr. Ramirez. Um, as you may have heard during the sound check, you can enter your written questions in the Q&A pods at the bottom of your screen. You can do it anytime and know that um, you can answer the questions anonymously, or you can share your name if you would like. And then what I'll do is I'll read the questions out loud uh, so Dr. Grosh can answer them during that Q&A session. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. James Grosh, who is Senior Research Psychologist and Co-Director Center for Productive Aging and Work at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. I'll begin with a little bit about his educational background, which is a rich, uniquely rich blend of psychology, business, and occupational health and safety. Jim earned a PhD in organizational psychology, an MBA in organizational behavior, and a Master of Arts in experimental psychology from the University of New Hampshire. Early in his career, he taught psychology at Colgate University in Hamlin, New York, and at the State University of New York. Subsequently, he expanded his expertise in psychology to include occupational health and medicine as he completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Wayne State University in Detroit. Incidentally, his postdoc training was funded by NIOSH and the American Psychological Association, and his doctoral, I mean, his postdoc research investigated the link between work, stress, and health, now a huge field. So, Jim, um, when we were chatting before this, Jim had shared with me that his focus on the field of productive aging evolved from his training and work as a psychologist, as he has always been interested in human development and understanding the different stages people go through during their lives. He also really enjoys the multidisciplinary nature of research on aging, as it can be studied from many different perspectives biological, psychological, and societal, and that includes public policy. After his postdoc training, 
Jim joined NIOSH as a Senior National Research Council Fellow, where he conducted occupational health and safety studies. Specifically, he developed organizational interventions to promote safety among healthcare workers and examined occupational differences in mental and physical health. In his current role as a research psychologist at NIOSH, Jim is responsible for conducting research on organizational level factors affecting safety and health in the workplace. He serves as project officer for studies investigating job characteristics associated with heart disease and depression, cognitive function in older workers, and the role of safety climate in promoting safe work practices. In this body of work, he collaborates closely with universities and businesses. I'll close my remarks by sharing Jim's comment that his five-year-old son, Nicholas, keeps him marveling at the aging process and broadens his perspective on what it means to grow older. And with that, Jim, we welcome you and look forward to your talk on productive aging and work, creating an age-friendly workplace. Can't hear you. Um, let me just say, it's really a pleasure for me to be here, um, I have something on my screen I'm trying to move around, okay. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I'm uh, familiar with this Nora Symposium and the number of years and the different speakers you've had over the years. And it's really an honor to be able to join you today. Uh, when I was invited back in February, um, I was really excited in part because Minneapolis is one of my favorite cities I'm also very familiar with the excellent work done uh, by the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota, as well as the uh, Midwest Center and the Upper Agricultural Center as well. Uh, and I was looking forward to being able to visit, to interact with folks, to hear about some of your work, to uh, exchange ideas, things like that. Unfortunately, as we all know, since February, a lot of things have happened, uh, many of them very unfortunate which has made obviously travel very difficult. So if you're curious where I am today, I am in a little town uh, by the name of Mason, Ohio, about 20 miles north of Cincinnati, Ohio, which is where the NIOSH office is, where I work, one of our main offices. Uh, and I just looked it up and I am unfortunately 715 miles away by car from Minneapolis. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to uh, visit one day and, and maybe interact a little bit more uh, with, with folks there. Uh, but in any case, the presentation I'm going to be giving is going to be on aging. Uh, we have a, a center on productive aging that I'll be talking a little bit about, but also just the aging process and some of the issues in terms of occupational safety and health that come up with aging. Uh, this presentation may not be quite as, as interactive as I would like it to be, but we will have some videos, some opportunities, I think, to chat and uh, time, as was mentioned, for discussion and questions at the end. Um, and, you know, an another thing about this presentation that Pat and, and, and others have mentioned is just that, you know, we are going through a very difficult time now with COVID-19. And age, as we all know, uh, and this is you know, kind of incidental to this presentation is a risk factor for severe reactions and mortality from COVID-19. So there may be information that we'll get a chance to touch on. I do have a slide at the end about uh, resources and some other things I'll, I'll try and get to uh, later on. But with that as a welcome and an introduction, let me switch over and share with you my screen. And this will take just a second or so. And we've practiced this, and I think we've gotten this down pretty good. Um, so let me just go over here. Okay, so this is just this title slide. Uh, this is our disclaimer uh, that the findings and conclusions are those of myself and do not necessarily represent those of uh, my home institution, NIOSH. Just to give you an idea of what we'll be covering today, uh, we'll start with a video and, and different views of what it means to grow older. Uh, there'll be some demographics, so some data, some graphs. 
I'll also give you a very quick summary of what we know about aging and occupational safety and health outcomes. Uh, I'll get into a little bit the concept of productive aging in our center at NIOSH, as well as a model that we use quite a bit, the workability model, which comes from the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health. Uh, we have a short video on uh, BMW uh, case study where they kind of implemented some interesting uh, interventions in, a, in an automobile plant uh, production facility in Germany. Um, and also we'll get into a matrix, a planning matrix, so there'll be some practical tools. And then finally, time for discussion and questions. So let me start with something that may be a little bit different in terms of how we think about aging, but I always think it's good to be able to see it. And when you think about aging, it's hard to see because it takes a little bit of time. But this is a video that basically just, it goes from 15 to 85, and it gives us a chance to maybe look at aging in progress, and then we can kind of talk a little bit about what it says about the aging process. 15. 16. 17. 18. 19. 20. 21. 22. 23. 24. 25. 26. 27. 28. 29. 30. 31. 32. 33. 34. 35, 36, 37, 38, 54 55 56 57 58 59 60 61 62 63 64 65 66 67 68 69 70 71 72 73 74 75 76 77 77 and a half 78 79 80 81 82 83 84 85 Okay, this video stops at 85 and what you just have seen is kind of in a nutshell what we aspire to study in our aging center at NIOSH, which is basically age-related changes in safety, health, and well-being across the working life. So this video went from 15 to 85. And of course, not all of us work all of those years, but this is kind of the range when people are working. And although we in the center do study older workers, and that is a group of particular interest, uh, when you think about it, all workers are aging. And at our center, we're interested in changes and transitions that younger middle-aged and older workers all experience. One of the things I really like about the video is just that I think it captures, I hope it does at least, the gradual nature of aging. It doesn't happen all at once. It's one of those things that kind of sneaks up with you with time, sneaks up on you with time. Um, and you can see how aging, you know, you might think of it as an accumulated exposure that happens gradually over time. Uh, also, I think the video kind of captures uh, a lot of the variability in how people age. Some people uh, may age more quickly than others. Uh, and it can be difficult to, you know, to tell who, you know, the, 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 much of a difference between someone who's maybe 30 and 35 or someone who's 55 and 60. Uh, and that reflects some of the variability. Um, also, you know, there's age that we saw in that video, but there's also gender, there's also race. And there are other things that might influence aging that you can't see. Things like, for instance, socioeconomic status, 
uh, you know, which would be education income, things like that. Uh, occupation is also something that might influence that process. And a lot of the, the research we'll be talking about during the hour kind of looks at aging this way. It takes a group of people uh, at the same time and breaks them into different age groups and then compares them on maybe injuries, let's say in the workplace or different health conditions. And a lot of what we know about aging is based on that type of cross-sectional research. As it turns out, that's probably not the best way to study aging. Uh, and we'll get to that in just uh, a few minutes. 15, 16. Do, uh, I thought I would start with a question kind of coming from the video, I hope, um, which is one that's always fun to kind of discuss a little bit. At what age do you become an older worker? And I have a few sample answers, but I thought we might try to do something with the chat if we could. And uh, if anyone out there would like to provide an answer, um, and I'm, I'm just looking for my chat screen and I don't actually see it on my uh, screen that I have available to me. So if anyone would like to tr tr type in an answer, and I'm, I'm trying to see the chat that I have, and I do not. Um, let me actually go back. Uh, and here we have some answers. Okay, so um, somebody said 55. We have 67, 65, 50, 70, 50. Would anyone like to suggest maybe a reason or, or why you think that particular age is one at which a person becomes older. I know that's asking for a little bit more in terms of detail, but we have a variety of different ages. AARP benefits is um, one, and as you probably all know, that can begin at 50, I believe, which is one of the answers we have, 65, 60. So as you can see, there are many different answers. Everybody answered, I think, with a number, um, and here's one uh, from Julie, physical changes occur that might change capabilities. Okay, so that's a, a reason. Uh, somebody said, my age plus 20. Uh, that's interesting. And of course, this is another very nice answer, which is one of the ones I have up is, it is relative uh, to what one was. Uh, post late retirement age, 65 and uh, Medicare, so they can refor uh, afford retiring. So there clearly are a number of different ways of thinking about it and looking at it. And let me go back and share my screen again with you. And hopefully I'll do this correctly. And we are back, I think, with the screen. And so just some sample answers, and I think you, you, you all hit many of these. Um, perhaps in the United States, the, the number that you find most common, I suppose, is 55, in part because this is a category that the U.S. Census uses, so we have data on it. Uh, it's also an age which people, at least in the U.S., often are thinking about retirement. Of course, it, it, it de depends on each person's individual situation, but it often is the point at which people are thinking of leaving the workforce. AARP, of course, is 50. Um, European perspective has always been a little bit younger. They, they say, well, don't wait until 55 or 60, start earlier when it comes to thinking about aging, start at 45. Uh, Age Discrimination Employment Act in the US is 40 years and above. And some states actually have uh, any age, you know, it, it isn't just 40 and above, but uh, the US overall uh, perspective is 40 and above can be age discrimination. Um, it depends on the occupation or industry. When I first came to NIOSH, I did some work in mining, and that is certainly an occupation, at least back then, and it, it certainly is today as well, that the physical demands can age people pretty quickly. I would think agriculture can in some ways be the same thing. Uh, although many you know, uh, types of automation have uh, improved that in many different ways. 
Uh, and finally, you know, it's a little bit like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. And there certainly is merit to that. And there's an entire area now that focuses on what you might think of as subjective aging, where you ask people not how old are you, which is chronological age, but you ask people, how old well do you feel? And if you think about that question, that's tapping into probably a sense of your own health, both physical and mental, maybe a comparison between how you are today with how you were previously, et cetera. And that type of answer, in some research studies at least, has been a better predictor than knowing somebody's chronological age in terms of various types of health outcomes in the future. If I had to choose kind of a number, uh, and I like the, the last two answers a lot, but if you had to choose a number, probably 50 and above, and that's kind of arbitrary to some extent, but I think that is an age at which some of the changes that occur physically, at least, can uh, have an impact on people. Um, just a little bit of humor, perhaps. Um, what we are looking for is somebody about 25 with 40 years of experience. And you know, that is a dilemma we're in. People like certain things about aging and they like certain things about younger workers. And I think both age groups can sometimes run into this. Um, okay, just to look at a few demographics and how things have changed. I've always liked this graph because it goes from 1900 to 2050. So this is both the uh, past and of course the present and also of course the future. And uh, there are at least three things to notice uh, in the graph. One is that we have more and more older individuals. And you can see that up here in the blue area. Uh, in addition, we have fewer younger people. And this is because of a lower birth rate over many years. And a third thing that's a little bit harder to see are the different generations. And it's been said that we can have up to five different generations in the workplace. The one that's pretty obvious here are the baby boomers. And these are people born between 1946 and 1974. And the baby boomers are responsible for this little bump here, this increase. And as time goes on, of course, they've added to it here and then here. And a number of baby boomers, of course, have uh, in some cases uh, passed away. In other cases, they have retired as that cohort gets older. Uh, and now we have more millennials uh, who are the younger uh, group of workers. And of course, that represents a change in many ways in the workplace that's important to consider as well. Um, in terms of longevity during this time, this is just kind of a, a very kind of quick summary of how life expectancy has increased. So back in 1900, the average number of years you could expect to live if you were born in 1900 uh, was about 48, a little bit higher for women than for men. Uh, and you can see over the years, it's increased in a pretty systematic way. Uh, and in about 1940, we have Social Security. And at that point in time, it was about 62, 64, something like that, a little bit higher again for women than for men. Uh, next, we had Medicare that came on board. And today, we're up about uh, 78 or so, a little bit higher again for women than for men in the United States. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware that in the last few years, life expectancy has actually very slightly declined. So if this were to continue, it would go down a little bit. And I'm sure with the COVID-19 crisis we're in the middle of right now, and I believe as of this morning, it was about 60,000 people that had died because of the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic we're in, in the United States. Obviously, this is gonna decline a little bit in the future too. What we don't know, of course, is what happens years from now. Other countries have life expectancies uh, higher than ours. Uh, the United States is kind of in the middle of the pack in terms of life expectancy. For example, Japan, I believe it's about 84 years of age with women uh, on average living to 87. Men is, I think it's about 81. So clearly there is uh, room to go and increase with time. Uh, what happens, we really don't know. 
those of you who follow things like uh, the genome study and our ability to kind of understand more about diseases on the genetic level and perhaps treat them on the genetic level, you know, things like heart disease, cancer, dementia, there certainly is the potential for this to increase in the future. Uh, one last, well, I guess there's a couple other graphs just to get through quickly for you. This is just the projected change in the U.S. workforce between 2012, 2022. These are the age groups. And you can see during this period, and we're almost at the end of it now in 2020, most of the increase has been here for 55 years and older, and especially 65 years and older. And for many of the younger age groups, it's close to zero, or in some cases, slightly negative. Uh, these would be the Gen Ys, uh, or the, the millennials that we hear so much about these days. Um, this is labor force participation. Uh, you can see that for people 65 to 74, this has actually increased uh, over 30 years in a rather consistent way. Uh, that's also true of people 55 to 64, which is that green line going up here. Um, and reasons for that include things like uh, lack of savings and pensions, as we know, have, have changed many different uh, occupations. Um, so there's a financial reason in many cases, but also there are positive reasons. Um, you know, a lot of work has become a little bit easier in terms of physical demands with automation and and uh, machinery and things like that. Uh, in addition, for a lot of people, if they're doing something they really like, there are lots of benefits in terms of a sense of meaning, uh, contributing to society, uh, making uh, social contacts and stimulating activities. So there are many positive reasons people keep working, although there are financial ones as well. The last demographics, uh, graph I have is just uh, a graph of what's called the U.S. old age dependency ratio. And this is the number of older adults in the population, so people 65 years and older, uh, to the number of younger individuals. So this is 15 to 64. And you can see it was pretty level for many, many decades. Then about 2000 started to increase. We were at about one older person for every five younger people or a ratio percent of about 20%. And then over time, and we're halfway through this process, you can see it's increasing, then it will level off a little bit. And then by 2080, and again, this is a projection, things can always change, it's estimated to be one older person for every 2.5 younger people. So the 2.5 are actually supporting the older person in terms of contributions to Medicare uh, and Social Security and other programs like that. And I show you this slide just to, to indicate that what we're talking about, the aging of the population, is not something that's going to go away in you know, 10 years or 15 years. It's going to be with us for the foreseeable future, for the decades ahead, although it will change kind of in how much it, it grows a little bit later on by 26 or by I, actually 2040, I guess. And again, we're kind of halfway up to that point. But it's an issue that's going to be with us for some time. Okay, so we, we saw that video earlier of uh, different people at different ages. And I mentioned that that probably wasn't the best way to study aging or to think about it. Here is probably a better way. This video takes about I think it's 20 seconds, and I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Okay, that was what we sometimes called an, call an age morph from 7 to 70. Uh, and of course, what this is getting at is a longitudinal approach to thinking about aging. So we follow the same person over time. 
And that's probably the best way to study aging from a kind of a methodology point of view. Uh, but of course, it requires a lot of resources. Uh, and unfortunately, in the United States, uh, we only have a few studies like this where we can follow people over time and see how those individuals change with time. Um, in this video that we just saw, if we were to follow the girl over her working life, uh, we would find, and this is an estimate from BLS, that she will have somewhere between 12 to 15 jobs. Um, and some of those jobs will probably have a variety of different hazards, uh, different types of exposures, things like that. And in the future, it may be as many as 20 jobs that she will have over that period of time. Uh, she would be exposed to probably ergonomic issues, maybe chemical, psychosocial stressors, things like that. We also know that uh, the health that she had at the end of that video uh, will be closely related to the health that she had at 60 years old and at 50 and at 40. So we can think of it as a trajectory um, over her working life. And one of the things we're very interested in at NIOSH is better understanding the, oops, I'm sorry, the role of um, work in terms of the trajectory that she will experience in terms of her health. Um, now, when one thinks about some of the issues um, that occur with aging, uh, there's a, a phenomenon that people have often referred to as the paradox of aging. So there are different ways to look at the aging process. Uh, it's captured, I hope, by this quote from Benjamin Franklin, all would live long, but none would grow old. And it's the idea that, you know, we like a lot of things about, you know, experience and, and having a long life or a long career, but nobody wants to feel as if they're just becoming insignificant and not able to make a contribution. So it's a challenge for us. How do we create a workplace? How do we create a society where people can uh, live for a long time and still feel like they are important and making a contribution? Now, one perspective on aging, this idea of a paradox, uh, that's a very classic way to think about aging. It comes largely from biology and medicine is aging is a process of decline and loss. And there's certainly evidence for that. Uh, we can also think of aging as a process of development and growth. And this comes really from the adult development literature over the last 20 years, which is a different way to think about aging. Um, and both of these, you know, decline and loss versus development and growth have evidence and there's simply different ways to think about aging. Uh, so let me just say briefly something about aging as decline and loss. I don't think any of this will come as a surprise. Almost all types of biological functioning decline with age, uh, vision, respiratory, uh, cardiovascular, many, many different things as we know decline from uh, the mid 20s, sometimes a little bit earlier. It can be fairly consistent over life. Uh, over one's lifespan, uh, some of the changes we don't notice until a little bit uh, later after they've accumulated, risk of disability and chronic health conditions increase with age, recovery following a health problem can be more challenging with age. However, there are some caveats. One is that there are enormous individual differences. As people get older, they get more different from each other as opposed to more similar. And some people uh, can seem to age more quickly than others uh, for reasons we're not completely sure, probably genetic factors as well as environmental factors. Also, the losses that we experience uh, may not necessarily affect work-related activities. So all because you're not as fast or not as uh, strong doesn't necessarily mean that much uh, in many jobs these days. So. Uh, sometimes the changes are there, we may be aware of them, but our job performance can be just as good, if not better. Now, I mentioned that other point of view that comes from adult development uh, work, aging as development and growth. We know that crystallized intelligence, which is the idea of accumulated knowledge and wisdom that we get over time, and if you're in the same job for many years, you can build up quite uh, an expertise in that type of work that tends to increase with age uh, and may counterbalance many of the losses and declines. Uh, we know that emotional health 
tends to be stable across the working life and may actually improve. And for instance, rates of depression have been found to actually decline with age, although it can increase if there are serious health problems as we get much older. Uh, but in general, things like life satisfaction, even job satisfaction, tend to increase gradually. And if you control for something like income or maybe where you live or things like that, we still find a difference. We still find that mental health seems to have a slight increase with age. Motivation and perspective may gradually shift and improve as one gets older. For instance, it's been found that with workers, they tend to become a little bit more focused on intrinsic motivation sorts of issues and less on achievement and getting ahead. And that as they get older, and you know, again, this is a subtle difference, um, you know, relationships matter more. Uh, leaving a legacy, uh, having an impact on other people can be more important. And some people have suggested that there is kind of a time frame issue here, that as we get older and get toward the end of our careers in the case of a job or the end of our lives is another way to think about it, uh, what matters to us changes. So the less time you have, uh, that has an impact on the motivation you have and the things that you consider important. So motivation can change. Um, again, there's a caveat. Amount of growth uh, that we observe may depend on your environment and the people that you're around. Also, it doesn't happen all at once. And with a lot of things in aging, it requires a long-term uh, perspective. So let me go from that, that paradox that we just talked about, to talk about some specifics in terms of measures of safety, health, and well-being. And what I have here is just a table. And I'm going to try and very quickly fill in the table for you in terms of things that show little or no consistent relationship, things that worsen, and things that tend to improve with age. And this is kind of like a very quick summary, kind of a meta-analysis of what we know. So I'm combining kind of the findings from many different studies. Okay, so these are some of the things where we just have, don't have much evidence for a strong relationship with age. And some people are, are surprised by the first one, core job performance. There's just no evidence that age really is that good of a predictor unless you're talking about you know a job that's all physical like lifting uh let's say a hundred pound bag of cement and carrying in a hundred yards something like that you probably would find a benefit of being younger in that case but most jobs are not like that and most of the research actually shows a very very slight benefit of getting older perhaps because of increases in what we had called crystallized intelligence a couple of minutes ago Absenteeism, just not much evidence. Ability to learn from new information, uh, the same thing. Uh, you, you know, maybe that older people take a little bit longer, but there's uh, certainly an ability that older and middle-aged and younger people all have to learn new information. Creativity doesn't show much of a relationship. Uh, the last one may surprise you a little bit, uh, although there's an asterisk. And what we have found, and these are in health surveys that are done of the population, randomized uh, surveys of workers, that if you just look at prevalence of back pain, that's fairly consistent over uh, the working life, and is about a third of the population uh, say that they have experienced some type of back pain in the past year. Uh, however, if we look at only those workers who have high physical demands, so they do a lot of lifting, let's say, uh, then we find there is a link uh, between uh, age and back pain. So what matters in that case is not just age itself, but it's age and the exposure you have in the work environment. So it's an interaction. So in that case, if you have a job that has high physical demands, as you get older, you're going to be more at risk for back pain. But of course, what probably happens in a lot of workplaces is that as people get older, they may shift to management jobs or other types of activities where they're able to reduce the physical demands. So that one's a little bit tricky when it comes to back pain. In terms of things that get worse with age, uh, rate of fatal or severe workplace injuries is clearly one, and that begins about 50 or 55 or so, and the rate of fatalities goes up rather dramatically from there. 
Uh, it reminds me just a little bit, although I'm sure there are differences with the COVID-19 um, uh, mortality issues that come where age is uh, a risk factor. Uh, the same is true overall when it comes to fatal injuries. Slips, trips, and falls are one type of non-fatal injury that increases. Return to work following an injury or illness can take longer. Chronic conditions, uh, and we know that these are also, many of these are related to COVID-19 mortality. Uh, work disability also tends to increase with, with age. And this is just a, a, a sample of, of some of the ones that have been studied. Uh, lastly, and we should never forget, there are things that improve with age. And these are things like overall rate of non-fatal workplace injuries. Of course, the exception is over here, slips, trips, and falls. But other types of non-fatal injuries actually go down. Uh, life and job satisfaction go up. Counterproductive work behaviors, things like bullying, workplace violence, things like that, tend to go down with age. It's not really dramatic, but over a working life, it's, it's quite noticeable and measurable. Presenteeism, which is the idea that people come in to work, so they're present, but they don't get much done and they're not very productive. That actually tends to go down with age. So people who are older seem to be a little bit more able to cope with situations when they're not feeling good in terms of continuing to do their job. And of course, this last one is related to crystallized intelligence, diversity of uh, knowledge and experience. So if we take away the middle and we are left with the things that worsen and thing, the things that tend to improve with age. And this again is that idea of the paradox of aging. There are things that get worse, things that get better. Uh, and this is again, just a, a sample of those variables or many other ones that if we had more time, we could go into. So a very quick summary of what we just kind of went over. Impact of aging is gradual. It doesn't happen all at once, it's variable and that people experience, experience it differently. And it's complex for things that get better and get worse. Of things that are a concern, these are many of the variables we just went over. I think one I did not get into very much was keeping skills current, which increasingly is important as we get older. Uh, things of promise, job satisfaction, risk averse, dependability, better organizational citizenship behavior, et cetera. Those are ones that uh, of promise uh, and implications of all this. Uh, we always say in public health that primary prevention is important, but that's especially true when you're talking about an aging population because if an injury or uh, illness occurs, it's much more likely to be severe or fatal. So the goal is to prevent it from the very beginning. So primary prevention really has to play an important role in aging uh, sorts of concerns. Uh, also, it's not just about age uh, and chronological, you know, what number you are at. Uh, it's also the work environment that matters. And one thing we have learned over the years is that there are many things in the work environment that can really make a difference in terms of protecting people's safety and health. Uh, also, as the workforce ages, an expanding, more holistic view of occupational safety and health is needed. And the center uh, that I'm a part of at NIOSH is kind of uh, focused on that. We are part of the NIOSH Total Worker Health Office, uh, which is kind of a more holistic, all-encompassing view of safety and health. And in our center, we try to reflect that. So we're a center for productive aging. Uh, and just to give you a definition, uh, productive aging is an approach that emphasizes the positive aspects of growing older and how individuals can make important contributions to their own lives, their communities and organizations and society as a whole. It comes from the work of Robert Butler, who was the first uh, director of the National Institute on Aging. And the idea, going back a few slides to what we were talking about uh, previously, is the idea, maybe I can just jump back quickly, is the idea of minimizing the losses, maximizing the gains. So doing things in the workplace that minimize those things get, that get worse, and doing things that take advantage of the things that get better with age. So let me just go back to that slide. So again, minimizing the losses, maximizing 
the improvements or the growth. Uh, so four attributes of how we look at productive aging. There's a lifespan perspective where we're interested in aging across the, the lifespan or the work span. Comprehensive and integrated approach to occupational safety and health. We'll be getting into the workability model in just a couple minutes. Emphasis on outcomes that recognize the priorities of both workers and employers. So often when you talk about productive aging, somebody might say, well, productive for whom? Are you talking about the organization? Or are you talking about the worker? Uh, and we really want to focus on both. And these are some worker-centered outcomes that a lot of workers would say are important to them as they get older. These are more organization-centered outcomes that companies might say is important for them. And a lot of research has shown that when you do things over here to improve it, those can have benefits for the organization-centered outcomes and vice versa. So when you improve things over here, that can spill over to things that are improved over here. So that's why we have a bi-directional arrow. And when you think of, you know, it's quite often these days we hear the term culture of health uh, and that a lot of organizations and communities for that matter want to build a, a culture of health. Well, we would argue that a culture of health needs to have both of these things considered and addressed and measured in some way. And that if you can do both things for the worker as well as for the organization, uh, that produces a very positive culture in terms of health and uh, outcomes uh, related to that. Okay, so the last uh, uh, attribute of this productive aging model that we have at NIOSH is just the idea of a supportive work culture for multi-generational issues. And again, we have up to five generations in the workplace, and there are many differences in terms of learning styles, use of technology, uh, preferences for information, communication issues, things like that that are important to consider. So our Center for Productive Aging at NIOSH, um, we are in the process of developing research goals for the aging workforce. Uh, we have members on the, in the center from all the different areas at NIOSH, many of the sectors and cross sectors as well. Uh, build and expand upon collaborations with outside partners, which we are uh, trying to do in some of, terms of some of our projects and activities that we undertake expand knowledge on interventions, best practices. And I think uh, kind of a need out there right now is develop a broad range of useful guidance and educational products on the aging workforce. And if I had to choose two different things that are probably most important, these last two, in terms of what can we actually do? What are some strategies that work? What are ways of disseminating some of the information that we've learned about aging and work. Because over the last 20 years, I think our knowledge of different strategies and different outcomes and things like that has increased quite substantially. Uh, but we always we not, have not always been as good in terms of communicating that. So what are organizations doing? And this is uh, findings from a survey by SHRM, which is the Society for Human Resource Management. They did a survey of about 1,700 companies, and they asked human resource professionals in those companies, what are you doing? And uh, if you go through these different response options, a lot of people said they were beginning to notice the issue, they were looking at the workforce, becoming aware of the potential change. Some people were not aware of it, but it's only 13%. Uh, and then a smaller percentage had actually implemented certain policies. And this is basically about, I guess it's about 13% had actually done something, were doing something, uh, whereas about 87% were aware of the issue. And I think uh, about 20% uh, had looked at things and decided that no changes were really necessary. So what this kind of finding, and it's, it's I think commonplace in occupational health, we find that there's a difference between knowing and doing. So a lot of people know about this issue, a lot of organizations are certainly aware of it, but not that many are doing things. So there's a need again to educate, to reach out, to address issues and concerns 
in specific sectors uh, where aging is, is, is an issue. One of the, 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 the models that we have used in trying to do this is called the workability model. Some of you may be familiar, familiar with it. It comes out of the Finnish Institute uh, in Helsinki, but it's been used now internationally and it's been used quite a bit in the United States uh, and has you know, different dimensions that we can look at in terms of targeting some of our efforts. So the goal is to uh, keep people working safely and productively with age. Uh, one of the dimensions is the work environment, things like ergonomics, hygiene, safety. The second dimension is the individual worker, things like chronic disease management, health screening, health promotion, training, mentoring, professional development. Um, and then finally, the organization of work, things like the structure of work, workplace flexibility, leadership, work-life work balance. Uh, and the model simply says that all three dimensions are important. Um, sometimes these dimensions in a larger organization can be in different places. They might be in HR, some might be in a safety department. Um, and quite often there isn't necessarily very much coordination or integration of these efforts. And the model uh, makes the point that it's important to look at all three areas, do an assessment of those areas, and then target each one if you can to improve it. Um, again, this is from the Finnish Institute. Yuani Elmerinen is one of the people kind of who uh, developed the model and it's had quite an impact in the aging uh, area. So let me now shift a little bit to a video. This is uh, one I mentioned at the very beginning, BMW, and they were faced with some issues around aging and this is what they ended up doing. Just looking at its 18,000 workers here, BMW worry the problem was inevitable. It's committed to producing more than 1,200 luxury cars a day with a workforce that's getting older. You could force them to retire, you could fire them, you could find easier jobs for them. Yeah, that, that might be the simple way uh, to, to solve the, the problem. That's not the solution we, we will look for, especially since... We don't have enough younger people actually to replace, so it wouldn't even work if we wanted to. It's happening everywhere. Over 65s will make up more than 16% of America's population by 2020. Germany's aging even faster. More than a fifth of the country will be 65 within 10 years. Even the smartest engineers at BMW had to accept that an aging workforce was inevitable. But they wondered if a workforce that's less productive might be preventable. In what the Harvard Business Review called an experiment defusing its demographic time bomb, BMW management tinkered with the staffing on one assembly line so that the average age of workers here would be 47. Then it asked them how to make things better. That's the new magnifying glass. That's the new magnifier. It's very simple because older people can't read anymore as good as young people do. Workers said their feet hurt, so the company made them special shoes and put in wooden floor pads. Some got a place to sit. Everyone got a chance to stretch. In all, there were 70 small changes introduced, including lost time. BMW says the project cost about $50,000. That's nothing. We basically thought it would be maybe 10 times as much we would need to invest. And it paid off. Productivity went up 7%, and the line's defect rate dropped to zero. Time off for sick leave fell below the factory average. All the response I've been receiving is, wow, it, it's, it's so simple, but it, it seems to work. So the experiment's expanding to other plants, including in the U.S. BMW doesn't think all its manufacturing can be redesigned to capitalize on an aging workforce. But it's confident that workers here won't just be getting older, they really will be getting better. Richard Roth, CBS News, Dingolfing, Germany. Okay, so that, that is, uh, I think, a very nice example of how one might approach 
uh, the issue of an age-friendly workplace. And in many ways, it touches on that workability model that I put up just a second ago. So let me just go through some of the solutions that were implemented in this particular plan. Uh, wood and flooring, well, that would be uh, the physical environment, the work environment that, that you try to modify. Rest breaks, that probably is a little bit more the organization of work and how they structured the working day and how people could take a break at certain times. Uh, time for stretching, that's an individual or a uh, health kind of individual health related sort of strategy. Uh, the same thing for footwear, where well, that's really more the environment, I guess, uh, changing the environment. Adjustable workplace uh, tables, uh, the environment. Uh, they didn't talk too much about job rotation, but in this intervention, they also rotated people through various assembly tasks. So you were never working at a very demanding one physically for very long. So that would be a work organization kind of intervention. Uh, large handle uh, gripping tools, uh, the physical environment. And one thing I, I think that's really nice about the video, uh, and perhaps one takeaway message, is that I think it's a good example of how small changes, they didn't really cost that much uh, individually, can sometimes collectively have a transformative impact if they're implemented properly. And in this particular case, you know, they got input from the workers, they discussed it, uh, they collected you know, data before and after, uh, and uh, a lot of the changes probably contributed uh, to the overall impact uh, that they observed. So let's say one is interested in this idea of developing a age-friendly workplace. Where does one begin? Um, and some of this, I mean, with any kind of intervention, you probably want to go through some of these steps. So conducting an internal audit. Uh, where are the most pressing needs? Getting input from the workers, as was done in that video, can be a very useful place. There obviously are records that companies have and, and the data can, that can be looked at in terms of safety and health and worker compensation data, things like that. Focusing on, again, these three dimensions, the work environment, individual worker, and how the work is organized and structured. Set goals. Uh, specific, measurable, achievable, that's uh, often considered to be important, and deciding what needs to be reduced uh, or improved, as the case may be. And then the idea of developing a plan or intervention. And we have a goal matrix in a second that I'll show you, and we can talk about how that might be used. And then finally, the idea of carrying it out, evaluating it, uh, and modifying it as needed. Uh, so I mentioned that goal matrix, and in some of the training that we've done in age-friendly workplaces, much of the training focuses on a matrix like the one you see on the screen here, where we've broken it down into those three dimensions, work environment, individual worker, organization of work. And what we then try and do, and this is usually done in teams of people uh, from the same organization in terms of some of the workshops we've done, is we work on the specifics. So what is the goal? What are the action items that you need to do? Uh, who will ensure that it happens? When will it finish? Challenges and responses to those challenges that uh, you expect uh, might happen. And this is, is something, you know, filling out a matrix like this can take a fair bit of time and it really gets into the detail of what you will do. Uh, and it's a very necessary part of it uh, once um, you know, you're, you've decided to try and make changes. Uh, in some of our workshops, we spend oh, upwards, you know, some of the workshops have been like two days and probably on the second day, we spend maybe four or five hours going through all the details, working it out, uh, getting agreement or a consensus on the best uh, strategies. Uh, so just to give you some examples here of the types of things one might focus on. So when it comes to the work environment, here are some areas, lighting, noise, workstation design, lifting, uh, conditions that may lead to falls, repetitive motion, reduction of prolonged physical exertion. Those all fall in that dimension. The individual worker, 
skills and abilities, return to work programs, training, screening, promotion, lifelong learning support. And finally, organization of work. You can see flexible work options, shift work and overtime, age diverse teams, job redesign, offering aging workforce supervisor training, mentoring programs. So those are just examples of some of the things you might choose. Obviously the, the particular work environment will dictate certain things as being more appropriate uh, than others. Um, and as I mentioned, if we can integrate these, if we can do more than one at a time, that's the ideal. So let me give you some examples of that. Uh, so we wanna reduce worker fatigue through better ergonomic design of equipment, so that's the work environment, scheduling practices, so that's work organization, and then exercise programs, which is focusing on the individual. So that is doing something in all three dimensions. Another example, prevent muscular skeletal disorders by redesigning how individuals do their work, so that's work organization, providing ergonomic consultation, so that's changing the, the work environment, and then providing education on arthritis self-management strategies. So that would be individual health. So again, all three dimensions. Here's another example, stress management efforts that reduce workplace stressors. Uh, so that's focusing on work organization, skill building interventions for workers. That is uh, individual health and then training for supervisors. And that would be also work organization. So again, those are just some examples. And the idea is to have something in all three uh, dimensions and work out some of the details. Um, now this matrix, there's nothing um, uh, perfect about it. Some people have suggested, for instance, that it would be nice to add another column here, which you could do on cost benefit considerations and to try and estimate what the cost would be for some of these uh, changes and what the benefits would be. And that's certainly another addition that could be made to the uh, matrix. So just some things we've learned in doing this kind of planning. And again, if we had uh, a few hours, we could actually get into this in groups and have people come up with different strategies. And it can be a very eye-opening process and a way for people in a work group, for example, to talk about uh, ways of, of making improvements. Um, some of the things we've learned, consider developing planning teams, including workers and management that meet regularly and represent different areas of expertise in the organization. Uh, choose goals that are large enough to make an impact, but manageable enough to be accomplished, uh, which is always important. Strategy should go beyond an educational or training cu curriculum. And certainly training is important and education is always important, but uh, changes in the environment in some way are also uh, important to consider. And then if possible, develop strategies in all three dimensions. Something we did not mention very much are intergenerational issues. And those are always important to consider. And those can also be uh, the focus of a number of different uh, strategies across those three dimensions. Okay, just some additional resources. Um, we have a home page. There's also the NIOSH Office of Total Worker Health. And again, we share with the Total Worker Health Office this focus on a kind of more comprehensive, holistic approach to healthy aging. Uh, there are other centers out there. One of them that is just excellent is the Center on Aging and Work at Boston College. Uh, and there's the Society for Human Resource Management that uh, provided the data that we saw in terms of what organizations are doing. Uh, I did not mention AARP, but they're another one that has a lot of good ideas and strategies and examples that uh, can be looked at. Uh, and I, I just thought I would, would uh, also include some guidance that uh, CDC and NIOSH have recently developed. Uh, this is on guidance for businesses and employers to plan and respond to uh, coronavirus disease 2019, uh, and NIOSH and CDC are in the, the process of producing more specific types of guidance now for various sectors 
and getting into specific issues in each of those sectors. And of course, as you all know, there's also wonderful uh, and increasingly kind of detailed guidance that's coming from many of the states. Uh, obviously, Minnesota is a very good example of that. I know where I am in Ohio, they're also doing that. Uh, and other agencies uh, and organizations uh, are developing guidance as well. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, and I thought, you know, I didn't have a great deal on COVID-19, but I did want to conclude maybe by just saying a couple of things about what we can expect uh, in terms of how uh, COVID-19, what we're going through right now, the implications of that for an aging workforce, because we know the workforce is going to continue to get older uh, and pandemics may be something that we'll have to deal with again in the future. So just a couple things to mention. Uh, and maybe in the discussion and questions, we can explore these in a little bit more detail. Um, but clearly, one issue I think that's emerging now quite, quite frequently is just a renewed emphasis on things like paid sick leave and health insurance. And uh, that's always been a concern, of course, in the workplace. But with something like a pandemic and, and an infectious disease like COVID-19, uh, obviously, if, if people don't have paid sick leave and come into work when they're sick, that can have bad repercussions for everybody. Health insurance also becomes important uh, in terms of being able to see a doctor before things get uh, really serious with uh, any type of, of disease, but, but clearly COVID-19 is, is, is included in that. Um, a second issue to consider with COVID-19 is that we know a lot of people, unfortunately, have either been furloughed or have been laid off and have lost their jobs. And we do know that with aging, as people get older, they have a harder time uh, getting employed after they've lost a job. And that may be an issue going into the future where people who are older, who have been furloughed or lost a job, may have a harder time finding something when uh, the workplace places throughout this country open up. That may mean they'll need more services, uh, perhaps training programs, things like that is something to consider. A third area related to COVID-19 and what we're going through, you have to wonder a little bit how all of this will influence retirement decisions and people's uh, desire to remain in the workplace. On the one hand, you might say, well, you know, the, with the economic uh, impact of what's going on, people may have financial incentives to stay at work for longer. And that certainly is very plausible, especially uh, as the uh, economy is, is not in very good shape right now. Uh, on the other hand, you might say, well, people may, uh, after going through a crisis like this, may reassess what's important in their lives. And some people may decide to perhaps retire earlier because they want to take time and do other things and spend their remaining years in other types of activities. So how it influences retirement remains to be seen, but it's, it's an interesting issue. And then a final kind of topic to mention is just the idea of uh, all the changes in the workplace that are already occurring. And what I'm referring to is really the increase in emerging technologies that are taking over many different industries of the changing nature of work. And something like COVID-19, you think would probably accelerate some of these changes. So things like automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, for example, 3D printing, uh, autonomous driving vehicles, all of those things have implications, I think, um, for aging and probably will be accelerated by what we're going through now. And in terms of an aging workforce, uh, that may mean a greater emphasis on reskilling the workforce, lifelong learning considerations. Um, and it's often said that, that technology itself is neither inherently good nor bad, but it's how you implement it that matters. And I think in the years ahead, as there's you know, increased emphasis on automation and remote working and things like that, that how we implement those programs really will make a difference in terms of how well uh, aging 
workers can keep up with the changes and uh, continue to contribute to the workplace. So with that as just a little bit of additional uh, information, let me end with two quotes I've always really liked about aging. Uh, this is from Madeline Lengel, uh, who was uh, a well-known author. She wrote A Wrinkle in Time uh, and has written many other books as well. The great thing about getting older is that you don't lose all the other ages that you've been. And that's getting at, of course, uh, the lifespan nature of aging, which is important to keep in mind. And finally, this is by Ingmar Bergman. They both coincidentally lived the same years and passed away in the same year. Uh, growing older is like climbing a mountain. The higher you get, the more strength you need, but the further you see. And I hope that captures for you a little bit of the paradox of aging that we were talking about earlier. So with that, let me stop and uh, thank you all very much for your attention. I think we have some time for uh, discussion and questions. Yes, thank you so much, Jim, for an excellent presentation. Really, very, very interesting. Um, so what I'm going to do, you guys, now is there are a couple questions that have come in on the chat feature um, as opposed to the Q&A. So I'll start with those. Let me just back up a little bit to retrieve them. So could you, Jim, could you speak to any gender-related differences? And do you consider that you might consider when creating an age-friendly workplace for older workers? Well, I, I think that's a very in, important area. And clearly in many different occupations, you know, we have differences uh, in the representation by men and women. And, and certainly looking into that and considering that is important. Um, you know, there are physical differences, certainly in certain chronic diseases and how they're experienced and how they impact people uh, and, um, you know, psychosocial kinds of issues can be different as well. So certainly uh, the nature of the aging population and gender issues are very important. Um, so we got a couple that have come in on the question line. Um, so how much of a good result at BMW do you think was due to physical improvements versus perception that the company cared? And is there any way to know about that? <laughs> I think that's a very um, observant question. Um, and, you know, there's always something to be said for the Hawthorne effect, for those of you who mm -hmm. do research at all. Simply giving people attention can make a big difference. Um, of course, with a Hawthorne effect or a placebo effect, it's also sometimes called that, uh, it can disappear with time. So people get attention, but they get used to it, and then maybe it doesn't have quite the impact. I do think in the case of the BMW case study, uh, there was something more than just a placebo or a Hawthorne effect, although giving people attention and letting them know they're important, uh, I think is important, you know, has many positive effects uh, to be aware of. But certainly the things that involve, you know, better equipment, um, allowing people to stretch. I mean, there, there's a, a, a very clear pathway I think you can make from that to the improvements that they found over a, a pretty good period of time. But, you know, the idea of how do we pull that apart? How do we look at one and see what percent, you know, attention accounts for versus the physical changes? That is, um, I guess, what researchers live to figure out. And in <laughs> these studies, obviously, it's very difficult to, to, to tease it apart. And some people, I suppose, would be very practical and, and, and say, well, does it really matter? We had a good impact. It lasts over time. Uh, we did reduce uh, injuries, and it's, you know, for a researcher like me, I like to know the mechanisms, but a lot of folks um, would just be impressed that it worked. Uh, that's a good question. Thanks, Jim. So here's another question. 
Sometimes it might be hard for aging workers to advocate for themselves, especially if an organization doesn't have a supportive work culture. How would you recommend these workers advocate for themselves? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, the idea of an age-friendly workplace is intended to focus on both the workers and the organization. And, you know, most organizations have a vested interest in the health of their employees. I suppose there are exceptions to that. But reducing healthcare costs, uh, having a motivated workforce. Uh, in the BMW uh, video, and th this may not be as true in the United States because we don't have quite the aging population that Germany does. But if you remember, they noted that um, they were going to have older workers. It was just inevitable. It wasn't something they had a choice about. It wasn't like they could get rid of all the older workers and go with the younger workers. They really had to rely on uh, the workers they had. So you would hope there are ways to convince an organization that it's in their interest. And, you know, a culture of safety is something that can't just focus on what the company needs and ignore the workers. Uh, so it really has to take into account both sides. Getting management to realize that I think can be a challenge. It may depend on the industry too and how replaceable workers are viewed, you know, in some uh, low skilled jobs, for instance, or maybe less concern on the part of management. Uh, it really depends a lot, though. Um, and I think there are examples now, more and more of them, where, um, you know, it's in the interest of the company to be inclusive, to think about its older uh, group of workers and try to leverage the skills and knowledge and abilities that they have that in many cases are very important. I'm sorry, I've lost the sound, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Now oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I can. my mistake. So can you talk, Jim, a little bit about aging in place and people who may work in the same job over decades and, how, and think they can do the same work? How should we engage these workers? Um... I, you know, that, that is, uh, I'm not sure I have an, an, an I mean, aging in place, when I, th I think of that, you know, there's an entire literature talking about aging in place in a home environment and mm -hmm. doing things within that environment to help people uh, continue to be productive. And uh, so this is outside of the workplace. It's, it's making the home environment age friendly. And what we've learned from that is it's important to involve the individuals in that process to look at it from multiple dimensions. So it's not just the physical environment, but that's important. It's not just the psychosocial environment, but that's important. And it's not just the, the policies of society or in the workplace, of course, it's the policies of the organization. So I, I guess the best answer I can have or I can provide for that, and it's, it's a tough question, is to uh, take a multi-level approach to it, you know, much like the workability model tries to do in terms of looking at different dimensions. And again, when it comes to, to that issue, it's more than just the physical environment, it's other things as well. And getting input from the individuals has to be an important part of that, I would say. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Jim. I want to go. We have questions coming in on two different uh, spots. So let me go to the other, the Q&A spot. So, um, Jim, this one relates back to, the, uh, to COVID. How would you advise employers relevant to safety in return to work for employees, given the pandemic risk? Um, very good question. I have to be a little bit careful because I don't make policy within CDC mm -hmm. or for NIOSH, so I can't really 
uh, and I, I would hesitate because I think there are people probably with more insight into it than I, I have. Um, I would say though that, I mean, it's clear that age is a risk factor mm -hmm. and, you know, as it is for fatal injuries, you know, that's another, that's a outcome that we see quite often. So obviously precautions need to be taken to protect those individuals uh, mm -hmm. who are at increased risk. We also know, for instance, that race matters. African-Americans uh, experience more mortality too. So, uh, and men are slightly higher, I understand, than women are in terms of mortality. So there's a bunch of different variables. But age is a pretty good predictor. And I think one needs to take precautions. Now, it really depends on the industry. You can imagine in some industries, people can simply work from home for a longer period of time. Uh, that may be fairly straightforward. In other types of industries, I mean, uh, in agriculture, in construction, manufacturing, you may have to be there. And then what do you do in terms of uh, providing uh, you know, as much safety as you can? And um, it, it's a challenge. I mean, I, I do think one nice thing about focusing on some of these uh, issues like around aging is that whatever you do is gonna be good for everybody because we know that anybody can get COVID-19. Some of what we're learning, and, and some of you know more about this than I do, you know, we're finding out that with younger people, it's not respiratory, but there are some rare cases where strokes occur in a way that do not with older individuals. So, um, you know, age matters, but it's not the only thing uh, I think any organization would also want to be careful of issues around age discrimination, mm -hmm. treating people differently on the basis of age. Now, age does matter, but it's not the only thing. And I think that's where it gets pretty, um, you know, specific to the actual workplace as, sure. to, as, as to what you might do. Uh, but it is a predicament because you want to keep people safe but you also don't want them to be penalized in terms of their work, in terms of their advancement within their job, things like that, uh, because of a demographic variable like age. Uh, Thanks, Jim. So I'm gonna to turn to Mirza now and ask, we have six questions on the Q&A pod, and we have four new messages on the other pod. And would you like, do we have the ability to extend the program a little bit or not? Because I know otherwise we need closing remarks at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, let's take like three more questions. I know, Pat, it, it's in your world to pick the ones that might be relevant. But I, there was one that I had seen that really struck me. Um, okay. And it was in work sites that make adjustments for older workers. How do they avoid age discrimination issues? And so I just was really struck by that kind of question and what your thoughts might be on about that. Well, I, I think in, in, in some cases, what organizations do is they talk about aging with the idea that everybody is aging. And instead of talking about age per se, it's, it's about um, you know, different health issues. So for instance, you can provide uh, training or education on arthritis without talking about age and indeed younger people experience arthritis all the time. So there are ways to focus on different health issues that are relevant to the workplace without specifically focusing on uh, a certain age group. And even if you did, I don't know what, how you do that. I mean, would it be 65 years and older, 55 years and older? I think it really varies a lot. And age is a continuous variable, and it's, it's not like one day you become an older worker or middle-aged or younger or anything like that. So I, mean, I think there's, there are ways to talk about aging, and the idea that what we're doing is intended to be available to everybody, for everybody, no matter what their age is, to take advantage of, mm -hmm. and it's focusing on promoting health. Uh, and you can do yoga, for instance, that can be very good for older people, but uh, certainly for younger people. So there are many uh, strategies, I think, that don't emphasize the age component. So, Sorry. sure. Should I, should I take more questions or do we need to wrap up? 
I think we need to wrap up now, but we know, I know we have a series of uh, still additional questions. So what maybe what we can do is compile them and then um, see if we can get some information from Jim. <laughs> um, but I do want to take just the last few minutes to express our deep appreciation um, to Jim for this really fascinating session. I certainly learned a ton. I appreciated all the examples. We learned um, the best way to study about aging using a longitudinal approach. I've learned about the aging paradox where the risks and important strengths and gains of having a wise crystallized brain as part of our workforce or brains as part of our workforce. And then ultimately prevention and which is holistic and your workability framework that addresses the environment, the individual and organization are really key elements. Um, so thank you, thank you Pat McGovern for moderating this excellent session and keeping us all on point. And then behind the scenes, I really also wanna acknowledge there's a large team of people that really worked over the last half year, I'd say, in thinking about this, um, Joy Archibald, um, Andy Ryan, Julie Alcorn Webb, Sue Gerberich, um, Pat McGovern, Susan Arnold, Deb Grove, our colleagues at UMASH, Jeff's group, Diane Campa. Um, so thank you for all that you've done to put this all together. We will archive the seminar online, so it will be accessible through our website, www.mcohs.edu. And Last, a couple of last housekeeping items. There will be a follow-up email with the links to the web, the archived website, as well as an evaluation. And for those, folk, those folks out there seeking continuing education, again, there will be emails without those instructions. And so my final words are, as we prepare for and respond to our growing um, workforce, both now during, during this pandemic and beyond, we are gonna be ready for all types of hazards and risks that might face us. And what we've learned today is of great importance, Jim. So thank you for sharing your knowledge and your time. Thank you. And thank you all for attending. Do stay safe and healthy.